Now, 2020 isn't exactly going to be a revolutionary year. Now, 2020 isn't exactly going to be a revolutionary year. Now, 2020 isn't exactly going to be a revolutionary year. One eternity later. Yeah. Well, I didn't exactly see that coming. Hey, it's John. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're going to revisit a video I did at the beginning of the year and see how well transit construction fared in the U.S. during the almost unbelievable year that was 2020. So how many of the projects that were supposed to be finished in 2020 actually got completed? Well, here's the short answer. And for the long answer, stick around for the rest of this video. Now the first project we're going to talk about is the implementation of positive train control. Now technically I was correct, but little did I know that when Congress extended the implementation date from the end of 2015 to the end of 2020, they buried a further extension deep in the fine print that allows railroads who have PTC running to allow trains to continue to operate without PTC until the end of 2021. Basically the railroads that were able to make the December 31st 2018 deadline, which are the four listed here, will be allowed to operate trains if PTC fails to initialize or fails en route until the end of 2021 without any operational restrictions. Beginning in 2022, they won't be able to operate trains where PTC fails to initialize, but they will be able to operate trains where PTC fails en route, although they will be restricted to the speeds listed here. All the other railroads which missed the 2018 deadline are required to have PTC installed by the end of 2020. With this early adopter extension, however, they also will still be able to operate trains that fail to initialize PTC or that have PTC fail en route without operational restrictions until the end of 2021. The only difference between the four railroads that implemented PTC in 2018 and everybody else is that everyone else can still operate trains that fail to initialize PTC until the end of 2022, albeit under the lower speeds listed on screen. This means that PTC implementation has effectively been delayed from the original date of December 31st, 2015 to December 31st, 2022 for the vast majority of American railroads. Now there are several caveats to this statement, most notably that the FRA can begin to enforce the non-PTC compliant speeds that would otherwise take effect in 2022 sooner if the carrier fails to operate at an equivalent or greater level of safety than the level achieved immediately prior to the implementation of its PTC system, which is unlikely to occur. So yes, all of this is kind of splitting hairs and dealing with hypothetical situations, but I'm not exactly thrilled by this delay. Yes, the vast majority of trains in this country are already operating with PTC initialized and working, but the extension will allow the possibility for accidents to continue to occur for at least another year. The next project I mentioned was the Crenshaw LAX line in Los Angeles County. I actually did a video on this project if you want to learn more about it. The line was supposed to be open in 2020, but it was announced in April that this project would be delayed by a year due to poor work by the contractor. Apparently, settlement occurred in the retaining walls adjacent to this bridge over La Brea Avenue, as well as defects in the track base structure in some of the tunnels. Metro was forced to contribute an additional $90 million to the project, but it will be interesting to see if the contractor will be financially responsible for either redoing work or delaying this project. The next project to miss its projected 2020 opening is the Silver Line extension of the Washington, D.C. Metro. Now this delay, I think, comes as a shock to absolutely no one. The project has faced several delays in the past, and 2020 has not been kind to Wamada's already strained budget. Apparently, a whistleblower complaint back in 2016 alleged that the contractor providing precast concrete panels for the project knowingly shipped cracked panels to the construction contractor. This led to Wamada's Office of Inspector General launching an investigation to determine how many cracked panels were actually installed. In September, they released a report that found 11% of the 1,600 panels installed at five of the six stations were cracked. Of those 184 cracked panels, 145 will have to be replaced before WMATA can take control of the line. If WMATA doesn't force the construction contractor to replace these cracked panels, the Inspector General's report outlined a disastrous scenario where these cracked panels will have to be inspected every three months in perpetuity, which would require single tracking of the line to perform the inspections. In addition to inspecting the panels, a crack filling sealant would need to be applied to all 145 panels every five years, which of course would increase the maintenance cost for WMATA. So yeah, this project is a dumpster fire at this point, and who knows if the line will even be open in 2021. 
I'm just glad I have nothing to do with this mess. Now for a bit of good news. The first phase of the BART extension to San Jose actually opened. This project had also been delayed several times and was originally supposed to open in 2016, but at least it finally opened on June 13th, 2020, right in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah, obviously the two new stations at Milpitas and Barry Essel will be much busier in the future, but right now they're pretty empty. As the majority of BART's funding comes from rider fares, the system, as well as most transit agencies in this country, are looking to the federal government for funding to avoid major service disruptions. I'm going to do a video in the near future on phase two of the Silicon Valley extension to Santa Clara, so watch out for that. Now the second project to actually open in 2020, and the second project that I actually did a video on, is the N line in Denver, Colorado. The N line opened on September 21st, 2020. Ridership on the line is also pretty low, but hopefully that will change in 2021. Unlike the other three commuter rail lines that RTD has opened as part of the fast track system, the line is run by RTD, not Denver Transit Partners, which is the joint venture that built the other three lines. Now I'm going to talk about two projects that I mentioned back in January. In the video I said that the tri-rail extension to Brightline's Miami Central Station was scheduled to open in 2020. Well, that didn't happen, and I think Brightline's actions during 2020 should be considered when advocating for private passenger rail in this country. Brightline suspended service on March 25, 2020, and their trains haven't run since. They also laid off 262 employees. On top of this, in July, they severed ties with Virgin Trains USA. Now, obviously, Brightline was always intending to provide a premium passenger train experience for a wealthier client base than most commuter or inner-city rail lines in this country, but one of the downsides to running a railroad like a business is that once the service becomes unprofitable, it disappears. I'm well aware that there's a lot of people in this country who view that as a good thing, but it is what it is. 2020 on the whole, however, has been pretty busy for Brightline. In addition to temporarily ceasing their train service and cutting ties with Virgin, they continued construction of their extension to Orlando International Airport, announced a partnership with Disney to extend their service to Disney World in advance of a possible extension to Tampa, and moved ahead with their goal of building another higher speed rail line between Las Vegas, Nevada, and Victorville, California. Brightline had an agreement with the state of California that they would sell up to $2.4 billion worth of bonds to fund the new line by December 1st. That date came and went without all the bonds being sold, however, so the state of California rescinded the bond equity to use for affordable housing projects. Brightline is still moving ahead with the project, However, they have said that they will attempt another bond sale when market conditions improve, which could potentially delay the project several years. Obviously, I want this project to be built, but until the High Desert Corridor and California High Speed Rail are constructed, this project's success will be severely hampered. Now, the next project I talked about in January is raising the speeds along the Chicago to St. Louis Corridor as part of the Illinois Higher Speed Intercity Rail Program. The pandemic has, of course, led to a decrease in service along this corridor. The route has been cut down to two trains daily, and the projected increase in speeds along the corridor are now expected to be in the first half of 2021. There is work ongoing in the city of Springfield, Illinois, however, to replace bridges in advance of the fully upgraded service, but the project as a whole has certainly been set back by the pandemic. Another project that I mentioned regarding the improvement of existing infrastructure is along the Northeast Corridor in New Jersey between Trenton and New Brunswick. Amtrak replaced electrical infrastructure, installed new substations, crossovers, and improved the track to raise the speeds up to 160 miles an hour or 257 kilometers per hour. Amtrak is also extensively testing two new train sets on both the Northeast Corridor and the Transportation Technology Center in Pueblo, Colorado. The TTC has already completed more than 20,000 miles of testing and reached a top speed of 167 miles per hour or 268 kilometers. And Amtrak is hoping to have the new Acela train sets in service in late 2021, which seems like an excessively long time from now, but what the heck do I know? And now to move on to another high-speed rail project. Texas Central has had a series of successes and a few setbacks in 2020, but a groundbreaking has nevertheless not occurred as was previously hoped. In May, Texas Central won a court battle that recognized their right to acquire land through eminent domain as they are indeed a railroad. This right may again be challenged in the future, but as it stands, they have already acquired about 40% of the land needed for the project. Later in the year, they also received regulatory approval from the Federal Railroad Administration, which largely paves the way for construction to begin, although the project still needs to be approved by the Surface Transportation Board. The project also, albeit temporarily, received support from the Republican governor of Texas, Greg Abbott. In early October, the governor sent a letter to the Japanese government expressing his full support of the project. The Japanese government has long tried to export Shinkansen technology to other countries, and in Texas Central's case, they've partnered with the Central Japan Railway Corporation, or JR Tokai, 
to partially fund the project. Governor Abbott received a swift backlash to supporting the project, and four days later his staff stated that the governor intended to reevaluate his support of the project. Purely from an economic, mobility, and environmental standpoint, the project will be beneficial to Texas as a whole. Various issues, however, involving property rights, nimbyism, xenophobia, and a reluctance to allow even a private railroad to be developed has led to the beginning of construction being pushed back to 2021. And just for good measure, in case you're looking to undeveloped modes of transportation to solve America's congestion and mobility problems, all of these issues are not exclusive to high-speed rail. Even if the technical hurdles of a Hyperloop concept could be overcome and such a system were built, all of these issues will most certainly plague any entity that attempts to build out such a system, whether public or private, and regardless of the state that they're located in, but that's definitely a topic for another video. Another project that failed to meet its projected 2020 opening is the CityLink's Gold Line in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Gold Line differs from the other light rail line in Charlotte, the Blue Line, because it is a more traditional streetcar line that runs on roads with mixed traffic for its entirety. Phase 2 of the Gold Line will add stations to both the east and west ends of the original line, allowing Gold Line trains to pass through downtown, or uptown, in Charlotte's case. The line will travel from the intersection of Beatty's Ford Road and French Street in the west to the intersection of Hawthorne Lane and Sunnyside Avenue in the east. In addition to adding 11 new stations, Phase 2 of the project will also see new Siemens S700 light rail vehicles replace the old Gamaco vintage-style streetcars that were previously used on the line. Construction of the line is largely complete, and testing is expected to begin in early 2021. The line is expected to be open to passengers in the first half of 2021. Now, the next project they covered back in January was the long-suffering Honolulu Authority for Rapid Transit light rail line in Hawaii. The delays and cost overruns with this project are pretty staggering, and it was hoped that phase one of the project between East Capole and Aloha Stadium would be open in 2020, but a number of issues have caused the opening to slide back to 2021. Dynamic testing is occurring on the line up to 24 hours a day. Following the completion of dynamic testing in mid-2021, a three-month trial running phase will begin prior to opening the line to customers. Phase two of the project has continued to advance with a projected opening date of 2026, but that timeline is very fluid. Utility relocation has caused challenges and led to work stoppages and design changes in 2021, and it's kind of anyone's guess as to whether heavy construction will pick up in 2021, but hopefully phase one will at least begin running. Some businesses along the line have blamed Hart train testing for brownouts and blackouts, but Hart has rejected any connection between power failures and Hart train testing. Further research is being conducted to determine the cause of the power failures, but it's just one more of the hundreds of problems that this project has encountered on its path to opening. Hopefully revenue trains will begin running in 2021, but at this point I feel it's pretty much anybody's guess. So thanks a lot for watching this video, and I think we can all agree that 2020 has been a pretty crazy year. Given the pandemic and everything else that's transpired, I think the fact that two transit lines opened this year is a bit of a win. On top of that, all the railroads in this country that were required to implement positive train control have made the 2020 deadline. So hopefully 2021 will be an improvement over this year as the world starts to get back to normal. Hopefully we'll see all the projects that were either supposed to be completed or break ground in 2020 reach success next year. And of course you can expect to see a video about that very shortly. 2020 hasn't been the greatest year for me personally, but there have been some bright spots. I recently reached a thousand subscribers on this channel. So thank you so much to everybody that's watched and subscribed to this channel. It really means a lot. I hope you had a relatively decent year and I hope you have a great 2021. Thanks a lot for watching and I will see you all soon.